I know, and it's painful, but it's so funny when you tell the story. <laughs> Please be advised that this episode of Caution includes descriptions and mentions of childhood emotional and sexual trauma, honor violence, physical abuse, parental control and manipulation, cult mentality, religious indoctrination, disclosure of childhood sexual abuse, incest, forced secrecy, survivors not being witnessed, domestic violence, poverty, state violence and surveillance, harmful body explorations, and crushed curiosities. We highly encourage our audience to review our trigger guide for self-care at healtoend.org slash caution. I learned from my neighbor's kids that if you go in the shower and turn on the faucet and open your legs and sit under the faucet pressure, water pressure will make you feel really good. And it feels really, really good. <laughs> So I tried it and they were right. There were other sexual things that are happening with these neighbor's kids. Like one time we were like, hey, let's show each other's genitals. But I knew that this wasn't something I could really disclose. So as soon as I started taking showers by myself, I was spending, my gosh, like hours as much as I could. Like my favorite thing was to try to stay home when family wasn't there. And I would take the longest fucking showers. I was so interested in doing this thing in the shower. I had no words for it. I had no context for it. I thought I'm the only one in the world who has discovered this thing. And my body is just very unique because if this was a common experience, somebody must have talked about it by now. I was reading a lot of books. I was a fucking nerd. I was watching a lot of TV. I was just like, nobody's saying anything. So I must be very unique in this experience. I didn't know sex is a thing you do for pleasure or your sexual organs are there for pleasure. So mm. I was just having an experience. I couldn't even identify it as pleasurable. I could only identify it as something I'm interested in going back to because it was a release. It mm -hmm. was different. It kind of escalated as I grew older into different types of masturbation that I was just obsessively always exploring my body and didn't know what it was. I engaged in a lot of harmful behavior towards my own body because I didn't know what I was doing and I was convinced I was addicted to this thing and it was a disease and that because I was doing it so obsessively for so long for so many hours and so many times I mean I'm talking about having like dozens and dozens of orgasms a day to the point that I'm just like my body hurts my hands hurt and I was like this is that I'm either getting cancer in my genitals or I'm getting cancer in my brain I just was sure of it and I had so much body image issues that I I would check out my genitals in the mirror and as you go through puberty things don't always look symmetrical or even after puberty but I was like look here is the evidence that I have cancer it doesn't look symmetrical like <laughs> It's growing a tumor, clearly. I fucked it up. I did a thing to it. And my biggest motivation for getting out of the house and turning 18 was to go to a gynecologist by myself because I wanted to be like, please help me. I have cancer of the genitals. I need help. But it was not an option to actually seek help, even though I was convinced I was diseased and I was going to die very soon before 18 because I couldn't go to the doctors by myself. One time, it was like maybe six, seven, and me and one of my cousins were playing in the room. And my mother and my aunt were in the living room laughing, having a good time. And we decided to play house. And I remember this like it was yesterday. I'll never forget it because we were in my mother's room, which was also weird because my mother never allowed anybody in her room. But there we were in her room. And we specifically said, let's play. And we picked two real people in the world. And we chose our roles and we played. We were cooking and laughing and talking. And then at some point, very naturally, we were both naked. There was no coercion or anything like that. And we were exploring each other's bodies. I think we were humping on top of each other. And I don't think this was the first time we had humped. So it was something that we went to naturally. And so at one point, we heard the heavy steps of my father's boots walking to the room and we got scared. We didn't have time to put our clothes on. So we ran and got under the bed. At some point, my father bends down to get his slippers, notices two naked kids under the bed, freaks out, what? calls my mother. 
mother, my mother and my aunt both come to the room like something horrible has just happened. Number one, because my father has witnessed two little girls naked. That's a no-no. Men don't see girls naked. So that was horrific in and of itself. And then my aunt and my mother both grabbed me and my cousin from under the bed, like pulled us out to take me to the bathroom to beat the living shit out of me while my aunt beat the shit out of my cousin. That very clearly indicated to me that I could never, ever talk to my mother about anything around bodies, nudity, something that feels good, nothing. And that connected right back to my CSA, my abuse. It was like, if I can't talk about this thing that feels good, I can't talk about that. My mother got super mad about that shit. And so anything that came up abuse wise, questions around sex, I kept it a secret. I kept it to myself. Then I became obsessed. It's funny that we both use kind of words like obsession, but I became obsessed with learning everything I could about sex. And my first teacher was Dr. Ruth. I used to listen to Dr. Ruth every single night, right next to my ear just to listen to stuff to learn. And I was like, what is this thing? I was obsessed with going to the library and sneaking over to the young adult section. And it was just all secret. I had to sneak, sit on the floor, read these books, look at the romance novels, just to read lines like heaving breasts. All I knew that is it made my body feel really good. And I wanted to know what this was and I couldn't. So because of the secrecy, because it was displayed to me that we can never talk about anything, it was just a, a shutdown. And my mother shut down those conversations at every turn when it came to talking about bodies, getting your period, the potential of having boyfriends, anything. No, 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 no. And so you learn real quick. Just shut the fuck up. <laughs> Were conversations around bodies, puberty, sex, and sexual violence shut down or approached with shame and secrecy in your family? Every family has secrets. That's not to say you're not entitled to privacy of information, but when there's a particular thing happening that you are told or you know you shouldn't be telling other people, there will be consequences if you do so. So it's like the mentality of the secrets must be kept in order for the family to remain integral, to remain together. There's this honor that the family unit holds. It's often held by the adults or maybe the male members of the family, depending on the culture. It's different from your personal integrity and dignity and honor of the individual. I think it's connected to this idea of if we omit, eliminate, and keep quiet these number of things we will avoid our children dishonoring us it just follows so many oppressive dysfunctional and disruptive structures and we can see this over and over and over and over again it's the playbook for control because if you're controlling information you're trying to mold and control a unit and you use the tools of dishonor and the fear of getting tossed out of family we lived in a family that my mom didn't like anybody coming over to the house. She really explicitly told us, do not talk about our family to anyone. Don't tell anyone what's going on in this house. I think we were like every other family at that time. There was addiction happening in my family. There's addiction happening in other people's family, mental health issues. But it was this thing about keep everything here. And so I couldn't have friends come over. I actually couldn't go over to people's houses. And really the only people that could come to my house were my cousins and my aunts and things like that. So there was a lot of secrecy about keeping this container, whatever the fuck that container was. So nobody could talk about us. Keeping the secret about addiction, you don't talk about that. I always knew that anything that can happen to my body, and it was very clear to me, that my body could be site of sexual violence, that the biggest damage would be the dishonoring of the family, that if I am sexually violated in any way, even catcalling, street harassment, even with mild sexual, mild sexual mm -hmm. violations of any kind coming from outside the family, of course, I'm not even going about inside the family. Those were not just insults to me. Those were just not violations of me and my dignity and my body they were doing some kind of irreparable damage to the family unit and specifically to my mother, my father, and I had an older brother. So he also held some of that responsibility for protecting that honor. But somehow I was not part of that. My only responsibility was to stay as far away from being violated or being interested in sex and bodies and any of that. 
I feel like it's really interesting. We talk about honor killings. People think honor killing is something that happens in backward countries, whatever. Honor killings happen a shit ton here in the US, but that's an extreme version of how the family unit feels so protective of this thing called honor that we see it happening in other ways like disowning or asking the person who's violated sexually to leave the family, to limit their contact, to even best case scenario, just look at them like they don't belong. They've been violated so an insult has happened to the family. I'm not talking about if the person who's been violated is at the center of this. Of course, it impacts everybody who loves us. That's not what's happening here. The difference is that the interest and the feelings of the person who's been violated is just not as important as the family unit's honor being violated. Honor violence is a mechanism to maintain or regain a family's honor by punishing or eliminating girls and women whose actions invite rumors or sexual impropriety or disobedience. Boys and men may also be victims of honor violence if they violate sexual norms or defy patriarchal authority. When you're queer, trans, your crime is that you have dishonored the family. When you are anything after the norm, if you're non-monogamous, if you don't want to get married, whatever is the norms and the values of sexual conduct in the family, if you step outside of that, specifically around sexuality, you have dishonored the fucking family. We cease to be us because it's about must protect this body that has holes in it because someone will stick something in it and keep them completely in a cocoon. Regardless of the reasonings, whether it is fear, love, protection, I don't give a fuck. The outcome, the trauma of that is really fucking intense. Around a decade ago or so, I came out to my family as queer. They meet a girlfriend of mine at that time and they go through the motions. The very last thing I was told about the subject was that I'm very disappointed in you. Just whatever you do, make sure you don't tell any Iranians again, about the honor of the family, about keeping the secret for the family. And it's about who do you tell who could possibly know who knows us? So it wasn't about, are you in a good relationship, a bad relationship? Are you happy? Does this work for you at all? And this has continued and continues to date. (laughs) As an adult in my (laughs) 30s, I am hyper conscious of how my behavior, even being here filming this thing, talking about this, I am breaking so many rules. I am crossing over so many boundaries I never signed up for. Never talking about the dysfunction in my own family. You're not allowed to do that. You know, you did something, something happened. And now the only way for you all to be okay and stay together is for it to remain a secret. If it wasn't a family unit, if it was any other group, we would call that a cult. (laughs) We would call that a criminal gang or something. So we have our own little family unit, gang units, where you try to get close to the leader because that's protection. You never question anything and you do exactly what they tell you to do. And that's under the guise of protection or even honor. So it really resembles prison culture. And I can't help but think that it also, in some ways, resembles domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and the ways that we say, don't think, just do, listen to what I say. We tell children, keep this secret and respect your authority as parents. Then we want them to do all of that perfectly. And then if somebody is sexually violating them and is telling them, hey, keep this secret, and respect their authority, which is me. But they need to know that they have to somehow figure out the difference. And then, of course, parents have so much power over children. Spiritual power, economic power. Parents have control over their children's bodies. We, as humans, are not allowed to actually unravel and discover our own bodies naturally. It is so normalized in the context of family. If you speak openly about these things, even if you speak to a therapist about it, even if you speak to your friends about it, if you seek help around it, then you are to be blamed. You are the one who broke away from this pledge that you have that you never actually signed up for. You have this oath thing that you have with your family. If you break this, you are to be punished. You are the perpetrator. But not only if you break it, if you question it. If you question the very core of what they're saying, why should I do this? I don't want to do that. You can't even say that because this is the family. This is what we do as a family to stay together. It almost reminds me of these shows that are like people who leave Scientology or shit like that. (laughs) 
for them to leave, it's such a whole thing. But then after they leave, they come for them. They threaten that if they speak, they're going to be in big, big trouble. And at the same time, there is also very much like nobody will love you. We are the only people, we're the only community. It's easy to identify those in different types of what we can easily consider cult like mm-hmm. behavior. But how is that different from the way that we have normalized family function? Family, yes, we love you. But don't you dare do something we don't like. Don't you dare criticize. Don't you dare point your finger at something that isn't working for you. If you do so, first of all, you will be gaslit into the problem does not exist. You will be questioned first. What is wrong with you for taking issue with the family? As opposed to, okay, you are a person with your independent critical mind and you get to actually speak about how you want things to be different. Who created the family structure? Who created the values? Who created boundaries? Are these non-negotiable? And how we get to renegotiate them at any point, if ever. There's a clear hierarchy here. And the very act of questioning is considered dissent. So how is that different from a cult? The same thing with religious institutions. A lot of religious institutions follow the exact same recipe. You got to follow the leader. Do not question the leader. Give them loyalty without asking why you're giving them loyalty. And if you have any kind of critical thinking, the very act of just having thoughts makes you a bad person who is not loyal enough, who does not get it, who is not pure enough, who's not close to God or respectful enough. In both dysfunctional families and cults, the definition of who you are depends on whether you behave or feel according to the rules. You have to conform to the group not only to be accepted by them, but also to be accepted by yourself. Both members of a dysfunctional family and members of a cult dissociate themselves in order to cope with the contradiction between the information that arrives from outside and from within. As a result, both develop a basic insecurity that causes them to become very vulnerable. From the beginning, we're told what is right and what is wrong and what to keep quiet, but it's already set up for us. We literally have to fucking figure it out at some point. And because we have to figure it out, because the information is so secret, then we keep cycling into that bad shit. We keep regurgitating it. It's all over the place. We always mirror the shit that we were in until hopefully one day we are trying to do some self-reflective work. Maybe we see the patterns of our dysfunction because it is there and hopefully we get to work on it. And some of us just fucking don't because we're busy living in this crazy container of a world and we don't have the time, privilege, energy to think about those things. So it's really shitty because it does affect the ways in which we connect. Because if you are so used to secrecy, then it wouldn't be such a stretch in your own relationships and DV can be such a snap. Secrecy makes a family. That one is very emotionally difficult because I grew up being told how to keep secrets mostly around political stuff because I grew up in a political family and under a lot of state surveillance. And so I was very young when I've already been trained in the differences of our family with other families and the ways in which we were being persecuted and so the things we needed to keep secret. But then outside of the political stuff and the larger issues that existed around religion and there was also growing up in a Muslim country but not very different from the ways it is here, I knew that anything that happens around bodies, sexualities and genitals and nudity are secretive issues and topics. I sometimes think about how fucked up it is for a child as young as three or four to know that. I don't think a three or four year old should know that nudity and sex and genitals are shameful, secretive things to hide. But I knew it. I was very aware of that. I remember being already very concerned about my body and how my body was being protected by my family from a very young age. It wasn't about my physicality. It was about my sexuality. It was about my skin. My family was on welfare when I was growing up. Those days, social workers would come at any time, knock on your door, go into your fridge, check your house and everything. So we kind of lived on edge and we had a drill. We knew exactly what to do as soon as somebody knocks on the door. And you're right. We knew exactly what the threat was. It was the state against us. And we were poor and we needed the money. My parents at the time couldn't speak English. 
fish. We needed that. We could not survive without it. And so we did what a lot of people ended up doing. And so that made sense to me. And I never questioned it. It was like, yeah, we take our family is important. And this is what we do so that we can survive until we can get a little ahead. But the other stuff around sex and absolute total confusion, even to this day as a full ass adult, I'm still confused by a lot of the things and the tactics and the pressure very much associated with our bodies, very specifically those assigned female at birth. A 2020 survey of 2,000 women found major gaps in women's knowledge to correctly identify their sexual anatomy. About 25% misidentified the vagina, about half misidentified the cervix, and about 60% misidentified the uterus. In the same poll, the majority acknowledged not knowing as much as they should, and they blamed their teachers, parents, the government, and religious institutions. After sexual violence happens, the desire to keep that a secret, especially if the harm doer was a known person. If the survivor comes out to even tell anybody that this is what happened, I think a lot of times they were asked to keep it quiet, again, to protect the family. I had told my mother in my 20s about the abuse. And of course, she responded, why didn't you tell me? It wasn't about me. Okay. And I'm just glad that I verbalized it and she knew it. At that time, I actually didn't ask her for anything. I just wanted to say it and I did. And we never, ever, 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 ever spoke of it again. Never. And then at this time, I'm in my 40s. I start doing this CSA prevention work more publicly. And so I go to them and I say, I'm doing this work. I'm going to be talking and I'm going to be talking about my experiences. And they were very nervous, but at the same time, they're like, that's your thing. It's your truth. You can do what you want. And that's not the response I wanted. Everybody knows what happened in my family. They've talked about it amongst themselves. They even talked to my harm doer. My harm doer admitted to it more than one time. So everyone knows about it. And that's that. That completely destroys me inside. It kills me. I hate going to see my family because it feels like I am completely fucking invisible. And they can't get why I'm 50 fucking years old and I'm still in this thing. Like, you can't see me. You can't see me because you can't understand that in this fucking house that my mother still lives in, in the very fucking same room right over there, is the thing that fucking happened. And you can't understand how difficult it is for me to come over here. You already know it, everybody's talked about it, but nobody wants to dig into the ramifications. They don't wanna dig into the hurt, the pain, what I'm going through, if I need a shoulder, nothing. Has anybody motherfucking checked on me? Has anybody ever said anything to me? No. My brother, I think, said he was going to kick her ass. And then I said, don't. That's not what I want. I just want people to know what happened and understand who I am and how I navigate this fucking world with all the shit that I carry. That's what I want. I want you to know me. But it's like, got to keep this in the house. We can't talk about this thing. People always say, what would you have liked? And I can tell you straight off what I would have liked. I would have loved... If my mother hugged me and cried with me, I would have loved for my mother to say, I'm so sorry that this happened to you, honey. I would have loved for my mother to ask me, what would you want? What do you like? How can I help you? How can I support you? And I probably would have been like, I don't need anything but this right here. I swear, I probably would have been satisfied with those fucking words coming out of her mouth, but she couldn't. I would have loved for my mother to call my father my brother, and even my close aunts and cousins to say, we want to share this with the family. This happens, asking questions if I'm up for it, allowing me to be a part of that process. Do you want people to know? Do you want people not to know? We can check in at every point. Wow, that would have fucking changed my life. All you get is, why didn't you tell me? I could have stopped it. (laughs) I could have stopped it. And then we never speak of it again. Her saying, I don't, I can't hear about this. Well, then you don't want to know about me. 
<laughs> you don't want to know about your daughter slash kid. You don't want to know. And she was like, we can never talk about this. Why? Because it's wrapped up in her emotions. It's wrapped up in her feelings. It has nothing to do with me. Or some people say it has everything to do with you. She feels guilty. And yet it's about her guilt. <laughs> it's not about me. And I'm here holding this thing. It's a cliche if people don't get it unless they have experienced it. And yeah, they really don't get the connection of a secret that happened to me when I was eight years old till 15, how that thing is still functioning and manifesting in my life. They don't get it. There is a painful, uncanny irony that in the name of familial love and loyalty, child sexual abuse survivors are overtly and covertly encouraged to remain silent. Family members and other caregivers will go to great lengths to deny, discredit, muzzle, medicate, or institutionalize the silence breakers. This must change. We need models of love with accountability. It takes so much emotional maturity, unfortunately, to be able to admit that you did something wrong to a child. And everybody, all parents, fuck up their children. I mean, that's just how it is. It's nothing bad about being a parent. It's just you're a human. And you're going to fuck up your kids in one way or the other, some more than others. It takes so much emotional maturity to be able to hold space for that truth. And then, oh my God, on top of it, to say, hold you, hug you, cry with you, not try to immediately find a solution and just acknowledge that, yes, the thing actually fucking happened. And now you can vividly remember it and your memory is correct and your feelings are right. I can't even hold back the tears thinking about just being witnessed. That's it. It changes everything for somebody to say, I see you. I'm so sorry. And I don't understand how it affects you. I don't get it, but I'm sorry. The secrecy is like this complete separation from these people that are supposed to be our unit. And that's what we learn. This is your family. You stick with your family. Nobody else matters. And then your family turns their back on you for something you didn't do, for something that was done to you. And because it's so difficult for them to talk about. And I'm like, hold up, <laughs> hold up. It's so difficult for you to talk about. Add about a hundred to that shit and then see how it is for us to talk about something that we were not even prepped to talk about, that we didn't have language to talk about. How confusing is it when you share a room with your sister, you love your sister to death, and this is the person that's doing this to you, and you can't tell your parents. I wish people could fucking just feel that how fucking horrible that is and just because the abuse ends doesn't mean shit that's still there and until that secret is talked about and hashed out whether with family and therapy with your friends your people other survivors it's gonna fucking fester and i'm privileged i get to talk about this shit i get to cry right here and talk about this. I'm feeling it because just, I couldn't even hold it back talking about the witnessing. It's the one fucking thing I've wanted all my life. I can't get it. And I won't, I'll never get it. Research indicates that on average, it takes between 17 to 21 years for CSA survivors to disclose their experience. About 60 to 70% do not disclose until they're adults, while a third never tell anyone. Studies show the longer it takes to disclose CSA, the more serious the symptoms are. When I realized I'm not going to be seen and heard by my family, I'm not going to be witnessed, they're not interested in knowing who I really am. They're not interested in knowing how their realities, their traumas, their lives, 
their shortcomings, but also their amazingness has impacted me. And I've grieved that for me as an adult because it's hard enough to not be seen by the people who are so close to you, the people who are supposed to love you as an adult, but I've had to grieve how much more awful that was to have that awareness as a child. As much grieving as I've done as an adult around it, and it's difficult day to day, I get reminders that nobody's interested in who I am, how I feel, what my boundaries are, what I need for respect. I am just supposed to act like a good child. As hard as that is, I need the rest of my life to fucking sit down and grieve, having had to do that as a child. And it's a lot. It's fucking too fucking much. I think the final result is that secrecy sucks. Secrecy festers, especially for kids. Secrecy is such a fucked up thing to do because it's a complete stoppage of any curiosity, any questioning, anything. And when you stop a child or anybody's curiosity or questioning or doubt or whatever, it's such a huge disservice because again, we're just falling in line and then continuing that cycle. We can, we can take a few minutes and check in too. We don't have to. We can keep going. I'm, I'm in it. I'm in it.